So the, uh, the big news, it's not news, is that the, the midterms, good morning, good morning. Hey folks. Hey, um, so the midterm is, is the next time is, is Wednesday, okay? And during Wednesday, I'm gonna have a, I have a regular lecture prepared. So the midterm will open up as soon as class is over and you have the rest of the day to do it. And it's open book. Um, but I, you know, I, it's not gonna be like easy like the quizzes. It's gonna be more like the participation questions except deep and we'll evaluate the answers. But we want you to try and integrate things. I've said this before, I'll, I'll say it again. We want you to try and integrate stuff. So if you've been keeping up with the lecture and you've been taking notes and you've been thinking about this stuff and Hopefully at the creek, you got a chance to do more of that. Hopefully in lab, if you're in the lab, you're doing that. But if you're doing the reading, it helps. But there's a lot of material to cover, I realized, going over it. And the idea is to be able to, you know, pull the, the factoids you've learned into like some kind of synthesis about evolution, about how fishes developed over time, into ecology, how ecology affected the evolution of fishes, and how the... The, the physical characteristics of fishes help that process and help them diverge into different radiations that made these distinct taxa that we're looking at today and to be familiar with the taxa down to order. So um, again, I've given you a lot of family information. That's really useful information. You don't need to know the taxonomy of the families or the genus species necessarily, but you should know that they belong inside a certain order so that you can orient them in the landscape of fishes and, uh, and sort of place them in the constellation of, of those things we call fish. And so I, I went through and I, I pulled out the key points. This is one of three pages. Um, pulled out the key points that, that should be, you should feel familiar with when you're sitting down to take the exam. This is the stuff you should know. And it's everything from, I'm not gonna read down this list, for all of our sake, but you should know everything from what is a fish to, well, to, to you know, to bony eared ass fishes, you know, and yeah, you know, you should, you should definitely know that to, to how the, the mouth works with, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, niche development. And um, you should understand the, the evolution of the mouth parts developing from a gaping jaw to suction feeding thin types and how those, Fin types, raised spines, how they support navigation and movement in fishes. Um, the basic characteristics of the different groups that I have up here and here. Uh, you should know the sensory structures. You should know the physical morphology in and out. You should understand a bit about geologic time. We've kind of done geologic time light in here, but that's all you need to know is the basic periods and when fishes evolved in relationship to those, especially the ancestral forms. I mean, everything has its roots kind of in the proto-Devonian, but the Devonian, there was a real radiation there. And that's, you know, most of what you need to know. A little bit about reproduction, including ovipary and ovovipary, um, the sharks, ray fin fishes, actinopter actinopterygian innovations is something I went on and on and on about. Um, ecological concepts like shifting baselines, fishing down marine food webs, salmon and steelhead. We spent a whole bunch of time on that hopefully be familiar with it. And then also uh, habitat and novel ecosystems. We spent some time on that as well. And that's pretty much it. So what I talked about, about Pewter Creek and what I'll talk about today and, and on Wednesday is not fair game, but everything before that is. So you know, as you're going through studying, making sure you hit these points, you know, make sure you go into the going, okay, what the hell is he talking about? Well, you should be pretty clear about, about where I'm coming from in each of these points. Because um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping for a good, a good outcome. There will be, as I said before, there'll be multiple choice. There'll be, a, there'll be, I don't know, ten to twenty multiple choice. There'll be some short answer questions, which will count up for the bulk of the of the test, and there'll be like maybe one or two long answer, which asks for more elaborate responses. Okay, any questions? All right, onward. Um, I posted a new module which is extra credit. So extra credit goes to, excuse me, extra credit goes to uh, your participation in quizzes score, scores. That's 20% of your grade. So it's actually, 
a substantial portion of your final grade, and it helps a lot. It gives you a bit of a buffer. It could probably bump you up a grade, maybe even more. I expect that everybody has an opportunity to get full points on this. And, and you know, I've, I've made the class this way intentionally. The idea is to get you excited about this stuff, to challenge you a little bit, but I also want to give you opportunities to expand your, your knowledge. So um, these are extra credit field trips. The Arboretum and Puta Creek uh, are sort of self-guided trips. Um, and in the modules, they come with a packet that helps you to know where to start and what to look for. Those two don't require a car. Uh, Lagunitas Creek to look in Redwood Creek to look at the Coho Run requires a, a car to get out to Marin County. The hatchery is up on the Feather River or the American River require a car. Uh, going to the aquaria, the, there's three pretty decent aquaria. There's the Monterey Bay Aquarium. There's the Steinhardt Aquarium, which is okay. And there's the Aquarium of the Bay, which is focused almost exclusively on marine fishes and is actually quite good for regional fishes. Uh, all require transportation to get there. You could take the, uh, the train to get into San Francisco, but it's a day long commitment, of course. And then the final one is the Pillar Point Tide Pools. And um, there we'll be looking at intertidal fishes, which we haven't really talked about at all in this class, but a chance to see a whole different group of fishes, mostly uh, Acanthopterygian spiny rayed fishes, um, which just tend to dominate the marine environment. Um, the tides are gonna be really low on Friday and Saturday, like exceptionally low. The tides are also corresponding with sunset. So, um, so getting there in the afternoon and walking out with the tides and trying to get back before dark is going to be really important. If you go yourself, you should bring somebody with you who's familiar with California tide pools. This is Pillar Point, which is down Princeton Harbor and Half Moon Bay. It's about an hour and a half without traffic to get there. Um, it's an extraordinary place. It's, it's one of the best tide pooling and, and mud flat clamming areas I know in this part of California. Um, it's where also where they hold the Mavericks surf contest, which whether or not you're into surfing, this is, this is like the giant waves that, you know, world-class monster surfing waves. And so when the surf is rolling in, it's really unbelievably crazy and dangerous because it breaks right over the reef. And so you don't want to go out during those periods. So pending weather, um, I'm going to go out there, I think, on Saturday. So I'll be there Saturday afternoon around 3 o'clock, which gives us probably three or four hours um, to walk out and explore the reef and come back. And you're, and you're welcome to join me. Um, if you're not going to join me, I'm just going to do if, if I don't go, <laughs> then you shouldn't either probably. Uh, if you go out on Friday, the tides are decent. Sunday, it's a little bit, it's going to be really dark really early. So, but if you, if, you, um, if you do go and you go on your own, just be really careful out there on the reef. Um, bring somebody who knows California reefs. Don't go by yourself because it, it could be kind of crazy. I don't want to lose any. So anyway, um, those, are, those are extra credit opportunities. <clears throat> People have been asking me about guides, fish guides, like real books which we've moved to digital books, sort of frustrating sometimes. Um, there's a few good books on fishes, but, you know, fishes are sort of, they're non-monophyletic. You know, they, they capture more diversity uh, than all the other vertebrates, right? And they have multiple points of origin. And so, you, you know, there is no good guidebook for all of the fishes because all of the fishes aren't really a thing. Remember at the beginning, I said there is no fish. It's just something we call that has a backbone and swims in the water with fins. Um, but regional guides are really good because they narrow it down. Uh, or sort of habitat guides can be decent for certain kinds of fishes. So a few that I recommend here are Milton Love's book, which is comical. Uh, certainly more than you'd want to know about the fisheries of the Pacific Coast, a postmodern experience. He's, a, he's kind of a funny writer up from, I think, Oregon State and uh, knows a lot about rock fishes and marine fishes. Uh, the Inland Fishes of California, you may have seen me pull that out on Saturday's trip, is a great book for 
the fishes, the mostly freshwater and brackish water fishes in California, both native in introduced. I think it's about 80 bucks these days. Um, so it's a spendy book, but it's a beautiful book. It's very useful. Uh, Miller and Lay's Guide to the Coastal Marine Fishes of California is the uh, taxonomic key that'll help you get down and figure out what kind of a sculpin you're looking at of 25 possible options, counting fin rays and whatnot. And you've probably seen that in the lab if you're in the lab. It's a very good book to uh, marine fishes. It's the, you know, it's not beautiful, it's not entertaining, but it's, uh, it's the way to classify what it is you're looking at. Uh, the Ecology of Marine Fishes is a book that I haven't spent too much time in, but is well recommended on marine fishes in California at UC Press. I'm sure it's expensive as well. And then there's a piece on deep sea fishes here, um, which if you're interested in that, this might be worth investing in. And then of course there's the Peterson Guides, you know, the, the little book of fishes. Um, we've all had those. And you know, um, this is not a bad book in a way, in the sense that it's cheap. It shows you representations of most of the families, fish families, and it's for all of North America. So it's not going to be that valuable in the field, but for 17 bucks, it gives you kind of like an overview all in a, in a you know, pocket-sized book. And so it's not a terrible book in, in that respect. It's just not necessarily going to get you down to anything past the most common fishes found across the continent. So, um, okay, I think that's it. Anything else I wanted to say? I don't think so. So let's move on to the lecture today. We've been um, we've been so we've been talking about the protocanthopterygians. We've talked about the pikes and the salmon. I've left out one group, the osmeriforms, which is uh, sometimes debated whether it belongs in the protocanthopterygian rigii. But uh, for the purposes of our class, we're going to throw it right in there. And uh, most of the uh, I should say, yeah, the, yeah, let's move on. So um, the osmeriforms, you know what? Today might be a little ragged lecture. I'm a little tired. Um, so, you know, the best way to uh, remedy that is just ask me questions. If I start blathering or you start falling asleep, just ask me a question. And that'll help write the ship for me and for you. That's what I used to do in boring lectures. Is think of a good question to throw them off. So, um, so protocanthopterygian, the main family I really want to talk about are the... Um, Osmeridae, which are the smelts, in part because one of the smelts is a very top source of uh, research and top, you know, it's a very topical fish. Uh, and um, so we'll dwell on it a little bit, but I wanna mention there's another family in the osmeriforms, the noodle fish and ice fishes, um, as well as the smelts. And I guess that's all I had to say about the noodle fish and ice fishes. I just wanted to throw it in because they're so weird. They look like noodles, and they're a big source of, um, they're, they're a really popular food item where in uh, Asia, particularly, where people pan fry them and throw them in on plates like this, and, and they pretty much eat the fish whole. There's only a few species where we do that, where we just pretty much eat the whole darn fish. Uh, these are one of them. They're the main other order in this group. You don't need to worry about them too much, because I want to mostly want to focus on the Osmeridae, which are called the smelts. And um, they're very abundant in Europe and Eastern North America, as well as the uh, Pacific uh, coast of North America. But our Pacific, our Pacific species, at least on the West coast of North America, seem to be in decline, especially some of the ones that you've heard about, the Delta smelt, the Longfin smelt, and the Yulicon. Of those three species, the Delta smelt is endemic to this region. So it's only found in the... Uh, Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta region. Um, so just to mention the others, because they're interesting fishes, um, although small, what we would call bait fish, they all look kind of alike, small silvery fishes uh, with very minute, they tend to be poor swimmers. They have very minute fins. Um, and I'll show a picture of one in, in a couple of slides here, but um, they all have distinct distributions and life history attributes that make them distinct. And I want to talk about the Yulicon or candlefish. Um, it's represented, it's, it's, um, it's threatened in its southern region of its population, um, but it's represented from California, northern California, all the way out the Panhandle and the Aleutians up in Alaska. It's a small planktivorous fish. It's semi-anadromous. Um, so it 
it basically it's marine species that comes back into fresh water or brackish water to spawn. And it's semoparous, so it, it lives a year or two and then dies, like almost all the smelts. It has an extremely high fat content. And so it was very useful for native populations uh, to use as food because it was a high fat, uh, really fatty fish, good winter food. You could, you could dry it and store it. Um, and it's a fish that when running, like in the breeding season, you could easily net it out of rivers and estuaries, which is back to the picture that I showed here. I didn't really talk about. It's kind of the one of the few fishes that you can actually just take out with a hand net and uh, scoop up, whether it's a, a eulicon <clears throat> from back in the old days or like a surf smelt, which come up and spawn on the beach during uh, full moons during certain periods of the year. Um, they're easy to capture. In addition to providing food, you can burn them like candles. They're so fatty, they're so oily that they will burn for a long time. And so they make natural light. Um, main threats to these fishes are climate warming, um, damming and diversions, which block, block their spanning, spawning roots, and also bycatch, a tremendous amount of bycatch associated with other fisheries that are not targeting them, but are nonetheless catching them. <clears throat> and that has, large population level effects, uh, especially in the southern end of the population where it's more vulnerable to warming. The longfin smelt is a smelt that we have in the San Francisco estuary. Unlike the delta smelt, which tends to be more interior, their distribution is somewhat more marine. They extend almost the same range that we saw in the Ulicon, only slightly more southerly, so that not quite as far out on the Aleutians, as you can see in this picture here, but, um, but a little bit farther south, including the San Francisco Bay, which is the southern end of its distribution. And um, this fish is uh, also, it's very much like the uh, Eulicon in that it's a planktivorous fish. And it's, we call this semi-anadromous because they're basically a marine species that just ducks into brackish water into the bay and estuary and then comes back out. And it tends to have a two year as opposed to a one year life cycle, or maybe it has, you know, has a bit of overlap. A recent paper by, um, by Levi Lewis and Jim Hobbs, which I've, highlight, whoops, I've highlighted here, um, found, uh, so these are threatened, I should say, in California, but not in their entire range, although they're probably in decline everywhere. Um, so this paper by Levi Lewis showed that um, the traditional model, there's a couple of different models for smelt, for lungfin smelt reproduction. And one had them basically living on most of their life in the marine system and then moving up into freshwater and spawning before, um, before either going back out for a second year or, or completing their life cycle and dying. But Levi found out there's mostly, um, and Levi is associated with WFC. He's a, he's a professional researcher and um, does really cool work with uh, otolith microchemistry, which is how he puzzled this out. He found out that they actually have a really diversified life history strategy, and they tend to use freshwater sources associated at the top ends of various wetlands and marshes. And so the thinking down here is that there's an extra driver of the decline of these species. It's that wetlands loss and connectivity to upstream freshwater sources, which would provide them sort of you know, micro habitats almost. They're incredibly abundant down here in the South Bay, even though it's very salty, but there's a creek coming in through San Jose and down into the South Bay that when it's been reconnected to the habitat through uh, wetlands restoration, allowed freshwater flows to go through. There's also a water treatment plant, um, so sewage treatment plant that provides a lot of freshwater as well. And he found them socked in there. So they did sort of puzzled this out both through otolith, otolith microchemistry and direct observation of where smelt were going to spawn. And so it's kind of a twist on the, on the kind of generalized anadromous, uh, anadromy that we find with salmon, for example, um, where they, you know, they're booming upstream, they're going to the freshwater, major freshwater sources. These guys are going to like micro sources of uh, freshwater all throughout the rim of really the, the bay itself is very brackish. It's very salty, really, it's almost marine. And it doesn't really, the bay doesn't become more fresh water until well up into the northern part of the bay. I've scribbled on it so much you can hardly see. But say up in this area around here, that's where it starts to get kind of brackish. Brackish is like 
between like 12 and two parts per thousand or PSU salinity. Uh, marine water is about 35 and fresh water is zero. So, um, so they'll go up into that region, but they'll also find smaller places of localized low salinity water where they can successfully uh, breed and uh, drop their eggs. So loss of wetlands is really important and also the loss of freshwater wetland, uh, fresh water sources. And then there's the Delta smelt. Ah, the Delta smelt. Lots of you had questions about the Delta smelt and why not? Because they're the, they're the, the latest species to go extinct in California or to be almost extinct. Um, they're just on the cusp. These, and here's a good picture of a smelt, which I hadn't included in the slides, I realized until just now. Honestly, they all look very, very similar, but they have different distributions and they have different life history attributes and they have different drivers of both abundance and decline. So it's an example of, well, parallel evolution, it's, it's um, they're, it's certainly not convergent. They're, they come from a common ancestor. It's just that they haven't diversified except in their behavioral and uh, reproductive strategies. Uh, like the others, uh, Delta smelts planktivorous, it's semi-anadromous. It has a semi-parous two-year cycle. We say a two-year cycle, but again, most of them spawn in the first year. So they have one year to get it right. And then maybe a few of them will live, a few large females will survive into the second year and be able to spawn again. So one or two spawning events. And, there, and I'm gonna spend a bit of time with these folks because it'll also help us learn a little bit about the San Francisco estuary and, and kind of what's going on with that system. So this time of year in the fall, um, they are, they should have been ramping up in the low salinity zone, zone by feeding a lot and getting fat. And they're waiting for the first flush of rain or water releases to trigger an upstream spawning movement. And so that having happened and the reservoirs, of course, everything in California is managed, right? So the reservoirs are releasing water, providing attraction flows, just like they do on Puget Creek, but up at Shasta Dam and Oroville, they're doing the same thing. We expect that those attraction flows will create this flush of fresh water and also sediment. Turbidity is a real cue for these fish. And so that sediment or cloudy dirt in the water will trigger them to start moving upstream. They're extremely poor swimmers. They have, you see these crummy little fins on them here? Yeah, it's, they, they ain't got much going on. So they're not like, a, they're not like a, a, another salmoniform that's a really intensely muscular, well-developed swimmer able to swim upstreams. These fish in particular have all the smelts, the Delta smelt is the weakest swimmer. So what they do is they surf up. They surf on the tides. When the tide is moving out of the estuary, um, that is the ebb tide, we call it, they swim towards the edges, towards the edges of the, um, of the estuary, of the, of the channel. And the velocity is not going to be as strong. The outward velocity, the ebb velocity on the edges is not as strong as the central velocity. So by swimming to the edges, they, they miss that big push of water moving in marineward, oceanward. And then when the tide shifts and it starts to flood back upstream, they jump back into the channel and they ride that up before going back to the edges and waiting for the water to ebb out again. And so by using this strategy, it doesn't require really sophisticated swimming ability because they're not going against the current. They're just going cross to the current during the slack periods in between flood and ebb. And by doing that, they'll hang at the sides, go to the middle, surf up, hang at the sides, go to, you know, they'll repeat the process. And they can actually move from around this region here, the Sassoon Bay area, which is their summer and fall habitat. They can pretty effectively move from there all the way up the Sacramento River, up into the uh, Cache Lindsay complex, which is the Northern part of the San Francisco estuary, where until for fairly recently, they had a spawning, uh, they had enough spawning habitat to successfully reproduce. So that's the winter migration. Hard to call it a migration, but it's a, something of a migration. They make it upstream. Some stay local and also reproduce locally, which provides two different opportunities for reproduction, right? Two different slightly overlapping life history strategies. One more localized in brackish water for years when they can't get upstream. The other, 
in freshwater all the way up in the North Delta. So when we were talking about a uh, portfolio effect, this is an example of a portfolio effect, you know, just one year or a two year lived species. And historically, they would have also moved down here into the San Joaquin, which is probably was historically probably some of the richest habitat in the Bay Delta, but which is now sort of a dead zone. Um, and I'll talk about why it's not viable habitat in a little bit. Um, so they reproduce in the spring um, or late winter, really early spring. Once they get up to their site, they'll spawn by attaching their eggs to um, probably to sandy substrate. In spite of how much we've stu studied them, we don't really know, but they like they seem to like small gravel, which doesn't exist much in the estuary. But if they can find it, that's where they'll lay their eggs. The eggs hatch on their own. The, uh, the adults mostly die or go back down river. And then in the late spring, they move downstream and then hold throughout the summer and fall, going through, um, going through metamorphosis into from larvae into juvenile stages and eventually into adults. And the, and the process repeats itself. Um, so that's, that's Delta smelt in a nutshell. Um, it took so many years and so much money to figure that out. But I'll come to that topic in a little bit. Their main threats right now, I've alluded to this already, are habitat changes, fundamentally altering habitat changes to the whole estuary. Uh, freshwater diversions that take water and move it in weird ways or just move it out of the system. Invasive species, uh, particularly clams, which provide competition, believe it or not. Um, aquatic vegetation, which has been introduced and contributes to habitat loss. And then as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, spawning habitat lost. And then I just put this picture in can delta smelt. And this is just misinformation, right? Uh, it's pretty funny. Environmentalists are outraged at the black marketing of smelt. Well, they, you know, that's hilarious because nobody can find enough smelt to market them in cans on the black market or any market. So um, anyway, I don't know why I threw that in. Uh, and then this map on the right shows you their historic range from the, uh, from the actual bay over here all the way up into freshwater, up at the ends of the Delta. This region here, this triangular region is called the Delta. Um, it's where the Sacramento River up north meets the San Joaquin River, and they form this sort of braided um, convergence of its tidal. And then this is the Sassoon Bay region here. Um, and this is the Carquinez Strait. Carquinez Strait, so it's sort of this narrow channel that the bay moves through. That narrow channel guarantees that on this side, the actual bay side, what we call the San Francisco Bay, is gonna be saltier than this side over here, which is gonna be brackish to fresh water because it just physically constrains the, uh, the energy of the tides moving through the system. So what, you know, what are the habitat changes we're talking about? People have been pointing fingers at each other for decades about what drives the extinction or what's driving the extinction of the Delta smelt. But the truth is it goes back over a hundred years ago, placer mining up in the uh, Sierra Nevadas moved about two or three mountains worth of sediment and silt down into the San Francisco estuary. And um, you know, basically they, they, you know, they use these water cannons to knock the mountains down and comb through the cobbles and gravel to pull, up the, uh, to pull out the gold. And when that sediment moved downstream, it completely re-engineered the landscape of both the rivers and the Delta. And one of the effects down, without going into too much detail here, one of the effects of, of all that sediment moving downstream was that it filled up the bottoms of the channel with sludge, raising the bottom and providing less room for water to go. And so people were farming the edges uh, of the channel on these like islands. Essentially they formed islands in the Delta. They were farming those habitats and they'd started doing that because again, the gold rush started to create a, a demand for produce. And so they found this really fertile PD soil in the Delta, started farming it. But as that slug of sediment came down, it started to increase flooding because there's no place for the water to go. So these former islands were suddenly going underwater. So they, they did the most immediate thing that seemed sensible was they developed the clamshell dredge, which you see in the picture here, and they started pulling uh, sediment from the inside of the edge and creating levees. 
And so those levees now were built up as barriers, but they were backed by these ditches called borrowed ditches on the inside. And this started another, this was the beginning of another massive transformation that was essentially a, a, a prime example of unintended consequences. So as they created these, these ditches on the, so first we, this, in this here, this is the pre-1880 freshwater tidal marsh. So they were farming these marshes or islands at about sea level or just above sea level. And then they created these levees here, including the borrow pits on the edges, and they were able to intensively farm the land. The problem with that intense farming is that it oxidized this really carbony peaty soil. And that chemical process of oxidation caused carbon to blow off by the tons, by the megatons. And as the carbon blew off uh, from a chemical reaction, it also blew off because of wind and because of water and exchange. The, these islands became increasingly subsided. So even as the channels were aggrading and rising up because of the sediment, inside the islands, the land was sinking to the extent that now if you go to the delta and you hang out in a boat cruising to the delta, you don't look up to see the land, you look down over the edge of the levee and you can see the farms and the sheep grazing and whatever, and it's below you in the boat. It's this inverted landscape where the land is 20 or 30 feet. It's like 10 meters below the surface level of the water. And so um, that's a major change. <laughs> here's a, here's a, a map of the Delta showing the degree of subsidence. So in red, they say this is in feet. So it's, it's 15 feet or more in some places are 20 or 30 feet. So 15 feet or more is mostly here in the central Delta, which had most of the really peaty landscape, but all the Delta is heavily subsided. So how does, you know, why does this matter? Well, it's because you've lost all those wetlands and it also precludes much chance of reversal. Why? Because it's actually so much accommodation space. This negative space has such an incredible volume that we can't even find enough dirt to be able to reverse the process. It would cost fortunes and we wouldn't even know where to source it. One of these small islands, Bradford Island, would take 63 Rose Bowl stadiums to fill it up. And that's just one tiny, tiny spot. So this is an example of an irreversible shift in the landscape that pushes it back towards what essentially I was calling a novel ecosystem last week, right? Um, so the other, so the landscape in the Delta began dramatically transformed. We lost wetlands. We got these channelized regions that were buffered by, um, by levees and these channels were straightened and they lost structure, which if you're an animal that surfs up the tides to get to habitat, then you're losing a lot of structure that might help you in that process, right? So that process started again, 100 years ago, uh, more than 100 years ago, actually. And then of course, damming. Damming changed the way that water moves through the system. And in California, every major river has been dammed. We've talked about this before. Um, and so <laughs> by the late 20th century, all those sediments that had been washing downstream, clouding up or clogging up the delta, suddenly every major river is dammed. And so the sediments disappeared. And so even today, every year, the water's a little more clear. So we've gone from like a sediment, uh, sort of a sediment stuffed system to a sediment starved system. And delta smelt like a bit of muddiness. They like turbidity in the water. And so as the water is clarifying, smelt are not happy. This is another blow and an unintended consequence of damming. And then of course, water management. So we do this weird thing here uh, in California where all the people who, who moved here decided to move down to the Southern end of the state. And all the rain that falls here tends to fall in the Northern end of the state. Some of the most fertile uh, agriculture in the world occurs down here in the San Joaquin Valley. And so, which is, was basically very desert-like. It alternated between marshy seasonal wetlands and a desert landscape uh, in the summer. 
So in the, in the early 20th century, California hatched this scheme to put up these dams and also to implement uh, canals that could transport water from the north to the south. And as the switching ground for all this water, uh, they chose the Delta. The Delta seemed like the logical place to do it because Sacramento River dumps into it and they cut a few channels and side channels and gates into the Delta and they developed the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project, which are pumping water from north to south. And this totally makes all the, all the hydrodynamics in the system bonkers. And we put it in and we've been managing it, but we don't really have control over it. It's such a complicated beast that, that we have limited control and people are constantly like the Bureau of um, a Reclamation and Department of Water Resources in California are constantly iteratively managing the system because even though it's a very engineered, well, you can't call it an engineered system, even though it's a highly developed system, it's not, it's not precisely engineered. And so moving water across that landscape is, is, is there are several challenges that confront us. And among them are maintaining the Delta in fresh enough water so that if you export too much from the system, you can't let the Delta become salty because there's agriculture in there and there's sensitive species. At the same time, because of that agriculture, it can get salty in the fresh water spots. And so if you pump, if you don't pump enough water in the right times in the right places, it gets too salty upstream. Um, flows for salmon at key times of the year rely upon the amount of water that you're pushing down the upstream river. And so that has to be factored into it. So these release flows for native species. And then of course there are water rights holders that have varying rights of seniority from 1914 water rights holders to uh, 1950s water rights holders that were basically granted water rights when these are called exchange contractors. This gets a little hairy, but basically um, there were farmers working along um, the San Joaquin River and its tributaries like the Merced River. They were granted water rights to Sacramento, Feather River, American River, Yuba River water in exchange for giving up the water rights on their own river because that water was captured and sent down to Los Angeles. So they're exchange contractors. They gave up their water rights in exchange for water rights from the North. And so the state is legally obligated to get water to them. And they've got to do that from the Delta come hell or high water or they'll be sued. So even in the last drought, the exchange contractors got a chunk of water and they kept on pumping, even though a lot of uh, water contractors lost water. So I give you that as a very confusing example of just how freaky and complicated it is, especially when you're trying to manage for a crummy little fish. <laughs> in the eyes of a lot of the Pay State, uh, a small little fish. Uh, and then that's, you know, I think though maybe from the argument that I've just put out in front of you, a lot of the hyperbole around Delta smelt, that is, we're not just managing water to maintain the Delta smelt. We're also managing water to maintain agriculture in the Delta, to satisfy water rights holders. And all of those have overlapping interests and separate interests in this weird Venn diagram where everybody's sort of like converging on more water at certain times and then diverging when they don't get the water that they want at other times. <sighs> I had to take a breath there because it's, it's, um, it's a lot to think about. So Delta outflow on top of all this, because of this engineering system, Delta outflows, that is water flowing out through the Delta and out through the Golden Gate has declined ever since the water projects uh, were implemented. So the blue bars here are outflow. And exports are what we call water that's moved out of the system. Um, the yellow line is local delta diversions that's in delta agriculture. And then the purple line is upstream diversions. So you can see that the biggest source of, um, or the biggest chunk of water over the years, especially from the 1920s, um, has been two sources. There's been, um, there's been upstream diversions have increased, uh, especially in the early part of the century. And also um, water exports to the South, this chunk right here has increased. And as a result of those increases, outflow has decreased. And that's probably had significant impact on species like the Delta smelt and other fishes that rely on clear water, or excuse me, clean water full of dirt to survive. So 
I talked a little bit about this, the dams control timing of releases and the state and federal aqueducts export millions of, well, they export water and they also export juvenile fish. As a result of these flow regime changes and shifts, and as a result of the export in the South, a lot of invasive species took hold. Let me flash through these, I'll try not to blind you here. Let me go back to a map. Okay, so the exporters are down here in the South and the water is imported from the North. So down here, there's these two major pumping stations and they started pumping so much water that sometimes water flows backwards, it flows upstream. And as a result of these changes, the, the system, you know, the system did not resemble the historical condition at all. And it was receiving a lot of pressure from invasive organisms. Shipping, which increased dramatically throughout the 20th century, but especially in the 1980s with globalization, shipping started introducing a whole suite of non-native species. And in the 1980s, in particular, there was a period where we had an El Nino hit, which threw a lot of water through the system, which was then followed by a drought, which was followed by another El Nino. And that combination of water scouring through the system, followed by a drought, cleaned out a lot of native species populations and allowed invasives to take hold. And key among those invasives are um, aquatic weeds, and a clam, a couple of different clams, and they all spread, they both spread in the 80s. I'll talk about what they did in a second, but suffice it to say right now, that one of the places that they both took hold when was the most altered habitat, which is in the south end of the Delta, the San Joaquin part of the Delta. So water diversions in that area really facilitated these invasions, which then on top of the landscape changes, really just the end of a lot of native species ability to live in that area. And also the end of salmon's ability to move through and spawn through that area, because in addition to the weeds, in addition to the clams, which are filter feeders and sucked up the uh, planktonic production, largemouth bass, which may you saw in Pewter Creek, these largemouth bass moved into the area and became top level predators, which ate a lot of native species. So, I'm trying to weave the web together here. On top of it, there's nutrient dumping and toxins, which have altered water quality, which have put pressure on native and introduced species as well. And then I just spoke about this. I'll come back to it in a second. There's been many, many uh, alien species introduced, some of them from the 1850s, but really many, many, many of them um, in, in the 1980s. And here's the key offenders I was talking about. The overbite and Asian clams, the um, overbite clam has a brackish water distribution and the Asian clam has a freshwater distribution. Let me check the time here. Ah, time flies when you're talking about crazy stuff. The um, together, so they're really aggressive filter feeders and they occur at densities of thousands per cubic or per square meter. So they pack in on top of each other and they can turn over the phytoplankton in the water column in a matter of days. That means that essentially the food web's been interrupted and they become competitors for food with other filter feeders like Delta Smelt. We also have invasive jellies, which can make the water inhospitable because they have stingers and they feed on plankton as well. And these are the aquatic weeds I was talking about. They essentially change the habitat. Smelt and pelagic species don't like that habitat. Largemouth bass do. It really took root in the South Delta in the 1980s, all these things, and has since spread throughout the Delta, especially with the changing climate. So this, this slide here basically shows really quickly what happened to phytoplankton biomass with the introduction of the clam. Here's the 1980s right here. This is when the clam was introduced and you can see phytoplankton just crashed and zooplankton followed that. Um, and so this diagram shows you what I was looking for before. Um, the arc of remaining habitat is the stuff that I study. Uh, and it, it occurs along the Sacramento down to the Sassoon Marsh. But the San Joaquin River has really become a terribly degraded habitat. So when we're looking at the decline of the Delta smelt, um, we can see that you know, the main threats have all been checked off you know, in the discussions that I've just told you. And this diagram here on the, on the right, which is something that we did for a paper 
which I don't know. I kind of regret doing it because it, it makes it as complicated as it was before without really explaining that much. But if you know, basically this, this shows the life cycle of the Delta smelt and it shows the various uh, factors that impact it. So in the wintertime, restricted flows and exports, uh, increasing growth of SAV. Um, in the spring, there's issues of entrainment of the larvae, which is basically the export facilities sucking babies out of the system. Um, in, uh, in that same period, there's predation by inland silversides, which is an, uh, an introduced fish that feeds on the larvae and eggs of Delta smelt. In the summer, there's restricted inflow to the low salinity zone, that is the Sassoon Marsh area. And there's also uh, food limitation from the clams that I was talking about up here. And then of course, uh, and that occurs throughout the fall, that critical period when they're, um, when they're trying to fatten up for the, for the uh, winter migration. So in a nutshell, that shows you, <laughs> you don't have to memorize all that. <laughs> it took me years to kind of figure this out and I'm still confused by it a lot of time. Uh, so what really killed the Delta smelt? What really happened to the Delta smelt? Some people say it was the number of published accounts. If you believe that uh, correlation is causation, then the number of published accounts of Delta smelt were solely responsible. That's like a nerdy academic joke. But it is, it does, it does, you know, the point here is on the right, you can see the decline in two of the surveys throughout the same period of study. And of course, the studies have increased whereas the smelt became listed in the 1980s, I believe. And then... Um, we're trying to find solutions for it. But the fact is that knowledge, knowledge alone is not uh, necessarily going to uh, reverse uh, massive ecosystem failures like this. You know, without the willingness or the capability to make those changes, it's not always enough to reverse declines. Currently, um, people are trying to figure out ways to reintroduce the smelt, but they're really faced with a fundamental challenge is that we have not been able to or been willing to reverse the ecosystem declines. Uh, and so without changing the habitat that they're reintroducing them to, the chances of success of releasing a bunch of hatchery cultivated fish into an ecosystem that's fundamentally the same are infinitesimally small. You've already heard me talk about hatcheries, production hatcheries and conservation hatcheries all face the same kind of problems in terms of restrict, restricting the genetic diversity of individuals being released. So highly cultivated, domesticated, tame smelt back into an unsuitable environment has a very small chance of success. For participation credit, I'd like you to think a little bit um, about this, um, comparing the life history of different salmoniforms. So the life history of Delta smelt is very different to those of salmonids, although it shares some things in common. So why are there so many strategies for salmon and so few for smelt? Just throw a few lines in there to think about it, if you will. Um, the upshot that I want you to think about, though, is that uh, the Delta smelt, just one canary in a coal mine, we still have the same problems. And the question becomes, what are we going to restore to? The system of the past is very, very different than the system that we have today. And the question becomes is, how can we get there and by what measures? And I guess at that point, oh, I got, I got a minute left. There's, that one. <laughs> There's one more slide. Uh, we've tried to implement restoration, but you can see it's postage stamp restoration. And Brian Williamson, our fearless TA, has shown that a lot of the restoration has not been very effective. Uh, and so we think that a lot of the reason for that is that we've created a novel ecosystem that doesn't function the way it should. When you restore a novel ecosystem to a natural state, it's still a novel ecosystem and we have to learn how to manage that. And I'll shut up now. Thank you very much for being patient with me today.